Scary Good. Welcome to Scary Good. I'm your old pal, Bigfoot. Today we've got a special All Glitch in the Matrix episode, and while making it, I've had nothing but computer problems, which is what you'd figure, right? We've got stories from PQ River and stories from Madeline Star. And let's get started right now before another glitch happens. Please take it away, Dr. Death. Glitch in the Matrix. Number one. The Trapeze Man is told to Peter Bernard, read by PQ River. Dear Scary Stories, I am an 18-year-old listener or viewer of your show, and I thought I'd submit this story, even though it's not about Bigfoot or cryptids, and it might not even sound scary. I have no explanation for it, even though it happened five years ago, and you'll have to take my word for it that when it happened, it was plenty scary to me and my entire family. Okay. I grew up in a house in a nice neighborhood in Connecticut that my family only moved out of last year. It had what I've later learned was an odd layout on the second floor where we all had our bedrooms. The door at the far end of the hall did not lead to a room, but a broom closet. I've been told it's strange to do it that way, but I'm not interested in architecture, so I don't really know. One Saturday late morning, my younger brother and I were standing outside the bathroom waiting for my mother to finish her shower. I forget what was happening, but we were going to go somewhere, maybe a ball game or a picnic. My brother had to use the toilet, and he was growing increasingly impatient, whining and knocking at the door. Finally, Mom came out and scolded him that he should have just gone to the other bathroom downstairs. Just then, really randomly and out of nowhere, there was a knob turning sound and the door to the closet down the end of the hall opened up. The three of us just dropped what we were doing and thinking and watched the door. It stayed still there for a while and I began to wonder if maybe it was just the house shifting or something. Then it banged open, revealing a man backing out of the closet. It seems he had pushed the door open with his butt a bit clumsily as it banged into the wall and then banged into him as he waddled in reverse, pulling something out of the closet. He was wearing a red costume from neck to foot that reminded me of what old-fashioned trapeze artists used to wear in early 20th century circuses. My mother put her arms around me and my brother protectively, but didn't stop us from watching what was happening. I could see what the guy was trying to pull out of the closet. It was a big black box on wheels that came up to his waist. He got the front two wheels over the wooden floor partition into the hallway. Moving in, are we? asked my mother sarcastically without a hint of fear in her voice. The man turned around quickly with a surprised expression on his face. He looked at my mother and locked eyes with me and my brother each in turn. Then he turned around and frantically pushed his big black box into the closet and slammed the door behind him. My mother shoved both of us into the bathroom telling us not to come out until she said it was okay. We heard a lot of noise outside for an endless amount of time before we got the all clear to come out. This was before the divorce, so Mom called out to my father who was downstairs, and he called the cops who searched the closet and found nothing at all. Dad told me later that one of the cops pulled him aside and told him my mother needed psychiatric help, because there was no way what she described could have happened. There was no other way into or out of that closet except the door at the end of the hallway, and there was no way a box of that size could have fit in the tiny broom closet. When Dad looked me in the eyes and asked me if I really saw the trapeze man, I got scared. I said no. Maybe that was part of the reason for the divorce. Maybe if I had told them the truth about the trapeze man, their marriage would still be together, but I didn't want everyone thinking I'm crazy like they think Mom is, and that's why I will only tell this story anonymously. I pray for each of you that nothing like this ever happens to you. It makes no sense, and it's really absurd and weird and seemingly trivial, 
yet it can mess up the entire rest of your life at the same time. Wherever the trapeze man came from, I hope he stays there and never comes back. The boy who liked pink, as told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. I had a glitch in the Matrix experience that altered the course of my entire life. I'm a college student and successful internet entrepreneur, earning six figures at the age of 19. This is a story about when I was in junior high school. Back then, when I was a kid, I had my own bedroom since I was an only child. My mom and her boyfriend decorated it in blue, which is traditional if you have a boy. At least that's how I remembered it. One day, I woke up and my blue room was pink. I asked my mom about it, who just seemed confused and told me she didn't understand what anybody was talking about until she had her morning coffee. I asked mom's boyfriend about it, and he told me that the room was pink because I had thrown fits insisting that it be pink. This made me laugh because I'd never done such a thing. In fact, the room had been blue when I went to bed the previous night. Saying that drew odd stares, and the two of them insisted over and over that the room had been pink for over two years, and that pink was my favorite color. I found when trying to get dressed that nearly all my clothes were pink. I chose an outfit that was as unpink as I could manage and headed off to wait for the school bus, skipping breakfast to get away from my parents. How had they changed my room overnight? Why were they trying to get me to like pink? Pink is a girl's color. On the school bus, three different kids teased me about not wearing anything pink that day. They all expected me to like pink also. That day was the worst day I had ever had in school, with every single bully giving me a hard time, but everyone else acted like this was a normal day for me. Somehow, Overnight, I had become the boy who liked pink, and that was reason alone for even the kids who I thought were my best friends in class to treat me badly. When I got home, my mom asked if I wanted her to buy some dye and darken some of my clothes back to black, or at least not pink for school tomorrow. She said if I felt like it, we could go shopping for new clothes on the weekend. She referred to it as my pink phase and said she was wondering if it would ever end. That was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Even my mother disapproved of me for liking pink, although I didn't like pink. But what would have been so wrong if I did? Why was something like that an excuse for everyone in the world to mistreat me? Maybe I didn't really like pink, but I liked it better than my family and friends at that particular moment. So I turned my mother's offer down, and accepted my new role as the boy who liked pink. I got to be a tough kid, willing to fist fight over the slightest insult. By the time I was in high school, I was the toughest kid around, and nobody, I repeat, nobody ever dared to put down my pink clothes. My entire life has been shaped by that one weird glitch in the matrix. I sometimes wonder who I would have become without that happening. My dog changed his spots, as told to Peter Bernard, read by Madeline Starr. Dear Scary Stories, I'm a female in high school. I'm writing to you because sometime during the night of August 3rd or the morning of August 4th, 2016, my dog's spots changed to opposite sides of his body and nobody will believe me. He's a beagle and terrier mix, mostly white with dark brown spots on his sides and tail, which is all brown. He was named Terry the Terrier by my creepy little brother. I wanted to name him Harry Styles, but my mother overruled me because she always sides with that little brat. The dog is much more mine than my brother's. He sleeps on the little rug next to my bed at night. The dog, I mean, not my brother. Anyway, about his spots, all I know is he had two spots on his left side and one spot on his right when I went to sleep, and then I woke up. He had two spots on his right side and one spot on his left. I took some pictures with my cell phone and compared them to older shots, and I was not imagining it. Although nobody in my family believes me, even with the evidence. My parents say, I'm just getting good at Photoshop and am faking the entire thing. 
Thanks for believing in me, parents. Hope you have saved up a lot for the therapy I'm going to need because of you. The Breakfast Glitch As told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. My mother makes me breakfast every morning before school. Usually it's some kind of egg thing, sometimes it's oatmeal, but she takes great pride in surprising me with breakfast ever since Dad died unexpectedly ten years back when I was eight years old. One morning, about seven or eight years ago, she woke me up early and told me that her Aunt Ida was sick and she had to drive to the hospital. She was taking the day off of work and I would have to get my own breakfast. She was obviously trying not to cry, so I gave her a big hug, and she left to go see Aunt Ida. I don't remember if I heard the car driving off, because I think I went right back to sleep. Okay, so eventually my alarm goes off. I get up, I take a shower, and I'm mentally prepared to make my own breakfast. Only when I get to the top of the stairs, I can smell bacon and toast and coffee and so forth. This set off alarm bells because nobody should be home. I walked more quietly and snuck up to the kitchen, wondering what I would use as a weapon if it were an intruder. I peeked around the corner of the kitchen door, and it was my mother, making breakfast. Back so soon, I asked, sort of surprised, but also a bit relieved. Back from where? she asked, telling me. Sit down. I just made you some bacon and eggs. I was trying to formulate a reply to her since I didn't understand what was going on, but then her phone started playing Chumba Wumba, which meant she had a phone call, so she took it and walked out to the living room to talk while I sat down to eat this unexpected feast. Less than a minute later, Mom was back with a panicked look on her face. Honey, I have bad news, she told me solemnly. Aunt Ida had a bad attack and they took her away in an ambulance. I have to call my boss and take the day off and rush to the hospital. I think she took the shocked and confused look on my face for sorrow because she gave me a big hug and told me that Aunt Ida would want me to be brave. She asked me to please clean up after myself. Then she left in a hurry. Everything after that was sort of back to normal. Aunt Ida survived that attack, although two or three years later she eventually died from something similar. But it happened in natural order. It didn't skip back to the beginning ever again. I absolutely have no explanation or even a theory as to what happened to me that morning, and I've never spoken to my mother about it in order to spare her feelings. Thank you for letting me get this weird story off my chest anonymously. Although, it's opened my mind to the infinite nature of the universe. It's also terrifying to me, and I hope to never experience anything like that ever again. I Remember Barbara, as told to Peter Bernard, read by Madeline Starr. I'm not sure if this is a glitch in the Matrix or a Mandela effect, but nobody remembers my childhood best friend. Her name was Barbara, and she had bright red hair like Barbara Gordon from the Batman TV show. The live-action one. That's, I think, why my family persists in telling me that Barbara must have been an imaginary friend, because she looked like a younger version of Batgirl, and people think that's the kind of person a kid might imagine for their friend. Barbara, however, was an actual girl that I was actually friends with in the actual summer, right before I actually entered the actual fourth grade. Her family moved away just as school was about to start, and I never saw her again. There was nothing magical or weird about her. She had no superpowers. She was just one of my friends who I would play with at summer Bible school. And she would walk over to our house most days, so we could play in our backyard. I don't remember ever going to her place, but other than that, she was a normal friend. I've asked everyone still alive that knew me as a kid, but none of them remember Barbara. I searched for pictures of the two of us, but I've found no photos at all of that summer, for some reason. It's not like now. It used to cost money to take photos, so people only did it if they really had a reason. Nobody in my family has a birthday in the summer, so we really had no events to commemorate. Hence, no pictures and no evidence 
that I'm not just imagining Barbara. Except I'm not imagining Barbara, I'm remembering her. Number seven. The Phantom Wetsons, as told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. I had a very strange thing happen to me. I'm not sure if it's scary enough for your channel, but it's certainly weird. Every day, I drive twice through Syosset on the Jericho Turnpike, once to work and once home from work. I'm in my 50s and grew up in this area. I've never lived anywhere else. When I was a kid, there used to be a Wetson's hamburger place on the Turnpike. Wetson's was basically an imitation of McDonald's and Burger King, but it had a slightly different flavor, and it was my favorite in those days. Today, there's a Burger King at that location, which I sometimes go to for some burgers and nostalgia. One morning, about eight or nine months ago, I was driving up the turnpike thinking about the things I had to do that day at work, and bam, there it is on the side of the road. Wetsons. It was a full-on Wetsons with outdoor seating and a drive-up window. I almost drove off the road. It was like seeing a ghost. When I got to work, I emailed my wife telling her they brought the Wetsons back on Jericho Turnpike. She wrote back asking me to pick up a sack of burgers for dinner. She grew up around here also and had equally fond memories of the place, which I thought went out of business in the 70s. All that day, I had a lightness to my step, and I was really looking forward to tasting Wetson's Burgers that evening. I'm sure you know where this was going. When I drove back after work, it was Burger King again. Equal parts disappointed, shocked, and weirded out. I robotically ordered some Burger King stuff for my wife and I to eat for dinner, not sure what else to do. When I got home, I acted like I'd just been joking in my email because I'd been fighting with my wife recently and didn't want her to think I was crazy. Since then, I would automatically lose most of those fights. She was angry at me that night, telling me it's right to joke about a lot of things, but one must never, ever joke about a Wetson's hamburger. Don't go yet. We've still got one more allegedly true tale of terror. The Voice Outside the Door As told to Peter Bernard, read by Madeline Starr Dear Scary Stories, I'm not sure if this is a glitch in the Matrix or what, but the strangest thing happened to me last weekend. My sister and I share a room on the second floor in our house, and our windows overlook the backyard, which has a wooden porch located directly under our window. It was a sunny Saturday afternoon, and I was in our room listening to music and coloring in a coloring book. I was sitting at the desk by the window. As I had sat down, I had seen my sister outside on the porch, doing something with her tablet, so I assumed she was still out there, although I could not see her while sitting down. Okay, so I'm sitting there, coloring, humming along with the music, when all of a sudden, bam, 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 someone knocks on the door. I stand up quickly, in total shock, my heart beating a million miles a second. Then I hear my sister's voice outside the door calling my name. I was like, oh my god, you jerk, you almost gave me heart failure. I thought you were outside. And at that moment, I glanced out the window and saw my sister, outside, still downstairs on the porch, still playing with her tablet. Everything froze, my body froze, time froze. I stood there not knowing what to do because I didn't know what just happened. After a while, I started tapping on the window to get my sister's attention. When I eventually did, I gestured for her to come upstairs. She looked annoyed, but she did what I asked. Soon the door opened and she came in, asking me what the problem was. I asked her if there was anyone else in the hallway when she came up, and she said no. I told her everything, and at first we thought it was a glitch in the Matrix that happened to us. But after a few days of reading the internet about stuff like this, we're not sure if maybe it was a doppelganger or even a rake or a skinwalker. The door was unlocked, but it didn't come in. It needed me to let it in or give it permission to enter. I don't know what it was, but I'm very grateful that I saw my sister outside before I invited whatever it was into the room. Get your Bigfoot for President t-shirts, mugs, buttons. Get them now at cafepress.com slash Bigfoot for President.
more scary stories.